So um, with that, let me introduce our first speaker. Uh, he certainly needs no introduction to you here in Iowa. Uh, he represents the people of your fourth district uh, in the United States Congress and has done so since 2002. Um, Congressman Steve King and his team have been incalculably helpful to us in putting this program together. I couldn't be more grateful. Um, but more to the point, I couldn't be more appreciative to the people like yourselves, I suspect, who send Congressman King to Washington because he has, as you know, become in just an incalculably important leader on so many of these issues, including many of those involving national security. He is the chairman of a group that, uh, that I think is as important as any in the Congress. It is the Conservative Opportunity Society. Um, through its good work with the true conservatives in the Congress, Congressman King has helped frame so many issues, including the one that he's going to be speaking about today, with which, as you know, he has become most uh, prominently involved, and that is this issue of immigration. And what we need to do to ensure that uh, the people that we're bringing into this country, we're bringing in because we want them to be here and because they want to be part of the American dream, not for any other reason. Uh, with that, let me present to you our first speaker to introduce and address the topic that we'll be starting with, immigration. Your own, Congressman Stephen King. <laughs> Thank you, guys. Morning, Frank. Hey, you bet. Thanks, thanks a lot. Thank you. Wow, thank you. Thank you very, very much. I just appreciate the welcome. I appreciate the chance to be here. appreciate Frank Gaffney and National Security Policy Center for putting this together. Uh, I will tell you that over the last two and a half years or more, I've been trying to push our national security to the front of the national agenda because I see how weak we are. And we're weak in so many different ways. And today, we're going to address four huge components of this national security. And out throughout all of that, we need to figure out how that fits in to the soul of the culture of America so that we believe and act on these things and we're strongly in support of the necessary changes we need to make in this country. And you know, as I looked at that, I began to raise, a, raise the issue and try to inject more and more into the debate. And I was watching what was happening from the White House and the foreign policy. And of course, the President of the United States sets our foreign policy. He's the commander in chief of our military. I would take you back further and say on uh, September 11th in 2001, we knew what happened. And we were organized together as a country. And actually, it pulled our country together. And when I saw the tears on the cheeks of people in New York that were washing the ashes off of their cheeks, I knew that we were one people, one America. We drifted a little away from that over this last administration. And we watched as wedges were driven in between people uh, that were I'll say they're told that they should identify themselves by something other than their membership in the human race. And so I see these things happening, and I'm watching political divisions. I sit in the Judiciary Committee and also the Ag and Small Business Committees, but the Judiciary Committee is the most polarized committee on the Hill. And it means that the people that are over on the far left, they sit over there, and they're sitting in safe seats, and their constituents uh, think like they do. And then the folks on my side, you know, we're just clear thinking, logical, full spectrum constitutionalists, of course. Um, but I watch those cultural divisions and those debates, and I'm watching as our border security has been getting less and less as the years go by. And then I hear through the news that Hillary Clinton said we need, she was in the Senate at the time, we needed to do something about border security. And then I hear Maxine Waters pipe up and say, we need border security. And then I hear Sheila Jackson Lee chime in, we need border security, because well, along the border, too many of their constituents were being killed by illegal aliens. Well, when I, my ear picks that up, because I study the group psychology and all those things that I try to think of the dynamics that help us do a little better job. In the, in the tasks that I have in front of me, I pick that up and I think, why is it that people, the last people you would expect that would be for border security are now speaking out for border security? And it's because we weren't doing a good job of taking care of it on our side of the aisle. And they saw a vulnerability. So you'll see the political center kind of move a little to the left and a little to the right, but sometimes 
if you get a little too far to one direction or the other, the other side will leap over the top of you and grab one of your issues and claim it. And that's what has been happening to some degree. It's shifted back a little bit now. But that's, a, that's an example that we're taking going back to 2004, 2005, in that era. Now, look how bold they've gotten. The, the Uber auto bond to amnesty is being advocated by a presidential candidate. Anybody that can get into America gets to stay in America, and we're going to give you a fast track to citizenship because, at least by the technicalities we have today, it's difficult to vote if you're not a citizen. Doesn't mean they don't, it just means it's a little bit more difficult. So they want to do this fast track to citizenship. So let me, let me take this back and frame it a little bit differently. I grew up in a law enforcement family. My father was a manager of state police radio stations in different locations around Iowa. My formative years down in grade school when I'm looking up at all adults and, and I'm watching my father who managed the state police radio station, the adult men around me wore uniforms and then uh, he was also the magistrate, the mayor of our little town and he held court when the town cop, Henry Nolte, would pick somebody up, they would have court. Well, there was uh, an, illegal an illegal alien that uh, was uh, discovered in this little town and he was brought forward before my father, the, put it in the term, magistrate. They didn't have any, uh, how did Al Gore say that? Um, there's no controlling legal authority. Well, they didn't have an ICE agent to call. They knew they didn't have any resources to go to, but they knew what the law was. And so they just brought him before the municipal court, the magistrate court. This is, as I remember it, as about a third grader, so it could be a little foggy. And uh, decided, okay, what do we do? Well, we sent him back to his home country. And so they put him on a law enforcement vehicle and shipped him south and shuttled him down. And I don't know if we ever got a report back that he made it back to his home country or not. But I'm just telling you that because that was the mindset. It is, here's the law. We enforce the law. We don't have to go through all of the idea of de developing just federal authorities that can do this. Local law enforcement needs to cooperate with all levels of law enforcement, all the way up to the federal level. And you don't get to say that I'm a city police officer, therefore I don't cooperate with federal officers when it comes to immigration law or any other kind of federal law. Law enforcement has always come together and, you, and you'll see them working together on cases, whether they're city police, county sheriffs, highway patrol, DCI, FBI, all working and cooperating together. And I grew up around that culture and now we have a completely opposite approach to this, driven out of the administration it had, and our enforcement of immigration has digressed each year since 1986. When uh, I, re I recall that year, I was watching the debate in the House and the Senate when the amnesty debate came up, and as I, I was convinced that no matter how the debate ended up in the House and the Senate, if the bill got to President Reagan's desk, he would understand how important the rule of law is, and he would veto that amnesty bill of 1986. And so I was... A, interested but relaxed because I had confidence in Ronald Reagan and that was only one of two times that he let me down a great man a great president only only one of only one of two times that he let me down it's dead um, so um, I'll speak a little louder for you in the back it looks like I may have lost my mic but that was only one of two times Ronald Reagan let me down but he signed the Amnesty Act of 1986 and I knew then I was not in politics I just wanted to raise my family run my business but I knew then that we had to go to work then and restore the respect for the rule of law because if you, if you f reward people for breaking the law, you get more law breakers. And once that reward is out there, if the one million people that pressed for amnesty in 86 became three million people that actually received that kind of an amnesty benefit, how many other people wouldn't come into America and just turn up the pressure for the next amnesty? Well, and we think there hasn't been one since 86. There have been at least six since then. Minor, not published as much in certain categories, but at least six since then, and that's before this president. And now we're sitting here with a president who has, who has taken his oath of office and decided that he can take over the Article I authority of the United States Congress, which is to, to make the laws, to write the laws. His job is to take care that they be faithfully executed, and instead, he decides that He's going to make up immigration law as he goes along. He's going to order his people not only not to enforce the law, he has ordered ICE to violate the law. There's a provision in statute that requires when our ICE agents 
our federal immigration uh, enforcement authorities encounter someone who is unlawfully present in the United States, that they place them into removal proceedings, shall be placed into removal proceedings. And that's, that's, that's the provision that he has ordered ICE to violate. That's how bad this is. So now we see DACA, we see DAPA, uh, we, the message that came out from the Gang of Eights bill that passed out of the Senate here a couple of years ago, when you look at that, that's amnesty. That is, that is instantaneous amnesty. It is prospective amnesty because anybody that gets into America gets to stay. There's nothing that's silent about that. If they won't remove anybody now, why would we think they'd ever remove anybody in the future if all the people here other than those serious violent felons uh, get to stay? And that's essentially it. So it's instantaneous amnesty, it's prospective amnesty if you can get into America, and it's even retroactive amnesty because it's got a provision in it that says, well, I call it the we really didn't mean it clause. Um, that is that if you've been deported in the past, it sends an invitation in the bill uh, that you should reapply because maybe under the new provisions, we wouldn't have actually deported you, so it was unfair that you were deported. Now come on back in, you all come back now, you hear? That's, that's the thinking that's going on in this country. And we love this rule of law and we love this country. And you cannot be a civilized country if you don't have the rule of law. It's one of the big reasons we have so many people that want to come to America. And so, okay, so I want to address then how big this national security component is with this. First, it's a threat to our culture and civilization. It drags us down towards the third world to watch our rule of law be just deconstructed and destroyed piece by piece by piece. That's, that's debilitating to a culture and a civilization. And, and by the way, we wouldn't have civilization if we didn't have the rule of law. And then on top of that though, the security for us internally to be safe from those who would come here to do us harm. Um, and I have, just to give you a little bit of credentials, I've traveled nearly every mile of the southern border from San Diego to Brownsville. I've sat down on the border at night with no night vision and sat down on the, on the wire and listened. And I, you see the shadows come through. It's hard to count shadows, but your ears will tell you and listen to the fence creak a little bit. I can hear the vehicles coming through the mesquite. I can count the time the fence squeaks, and I know about how many shadows I think I saw. I've seen that. I have, I've been there over and over when we, we uh, went down to, and traveled the border and helped with law enforcement, mostly rode with them, but I've also unloaded illegal drugs out of the back of a vehicle that were smuggled into the United States. And I look at the data that's there, the Drug Enforcement Agency's data. And I've probably sat in on more immigration hearings than anybody in Congress and read more of those kind of reports than anybody there. So I'll just tell you, this is a big problem. At the peak of this, back in about 2007 or so, we had testimony from the Border Patrol that said that they thought they interdicted about 25% of those that tried to get in, 25%. And so that meant then that 75% were getting through at least because they're not going to give us a, a lowball number. I go down to the border and I ask them, and they say, well, I had 10% has to come first. We interdict maybe 10% first. But I'll go with the 25% number, and looking at their interdiction numbers, during the peak of that time, that turned out to be 4 million attempts a year. 4 million attempts a year, that's 11,000 a night. And to put that in perspective, and I say at night, not a day, because it is almost all at night, that 11,000. That's twice the size of Santa Ana's army every night. Now it's about half of that, as my guess. So it's equivalent to Santa Ana's army every night, still coming into the United States. Some go back, some die here, many stay. I don't believe it's only 11 million. It was 12 million when I went to Congress 12 more years ago. Now it's 11 million, what happened? They're still coming over, aren't they? Aren't they still staying? If there's not, we don't have an immigration problem. So, but here's this security at the border is just it is a scary proposition to think that 80 to 90 percent of the illegal drugs consumed in America come from or through Mexico. 80, 80 to 90 percent of them. And when I asked drug enforcement people, what if, um, what if everybody woke up magically in their home country tomorrow morning? It's a hypothetical, I know, and some politicians answer those questions. Some bureaucrats do too. And and this, that happened, they, I said, what would happen to the illegal drug distribution chain in America? 
is that it would sever at least one link in every chain. There would, it would immediately stop all illegal drug distribution in America. I, should, I guess I have to say almost all. And that it would, uh, but they would reconstruct that chain because the demand in the United States is what it is. But that tells you how much we're tied to and wired through the illegal, the illegal, mostly Mexican drug cartels that provide billions of dollars worth of illegal drugs into this country, at least a $60 billion business. It's probably a lot more than that. And the flow across the border, when you travel the border, um, for example, New Mexico, you can't go down there and see where the border is. It's only marked by a concrete pylon from horizon to high horizon, as far as you can see with one of those big old brass transits that they used back in those days when they surveyed. That's it. The Arizona border, four or five rusty barbed wires that are already separated because they climbed through there. Texas border, a lot of that's the same way. Or just the river, the river that sometimes has water in it. And then we have the Border Patrol at, I stood there with Michelle Bachman last summer at Laredo, excuse me, at Roma, Texas, and we watched as the Mexicans on the other side were doing their Sunday afternoon swim. We watched as two coyotes inflated a raft, put a pregnant lady in it, ran the raft over across the river, parked it on our side, and then, and then they helped her out and set her on, stood her on our side of the river. I stood there with two Border Patrol agents. Their level of anxiety was less than it would be if it were the city police in Waukee writing a speeding ticket. They're there to be the welcome wagon now. And this is by order from on high. It also is pouring people in from the Middle East in an accelerated fashion. It looks like it's by design. Now, I want to just bring this together into this. There are two huge haystacks in America that threaten the security in this country. One of them is the illegal drug cartels. They swim within the illegal immigration that's in America. Think of it as 20 or more million people of a similar ethnicity, a similar, similar language skill. And even though almost all of them are wonderful people, they are the stream within which flows those who are doing us harm. That's also the same with the Muslim population in America. And you saw it in Garland, Texas. I hosted Gert Wilders. Uh, in Washington, D.C., four places, four, four different locations in Washington, D.C. that week. I knew he was going to Garland, Texas to join up with Pam Gellers and do that event down there. And when I saw that, if they had told me, well, I got a call 20 minutes after the shooting began in Garland, Texas. When I heard that, I knew, I knew where it was. If you had told me there was a shooting that was inspired by ISIS, I would, I would, could have, I would, I would have told you easily, Garland, Texas is where it's going to be. These people come to kill us. They want to impose by threat their Sharia law on us. Now, I want the rule of law, not Sharia law. And I want secure borders because we are a sovereign nation for all kinds of reasons. And I want to have a safe society that doesn't reward people that have come here to attack Western civilization. And maybe just to close this out and turn it into any questions that we might have the time for, and there are only going to be a few minutes for that, maybe just to do that. Um, I would, I would say this, um, Gert Wilders, Member of Parliament in the Netherlands, said something really clearly that I hadn't heard said out loud in a public debate in way too long. He said, Western civilization is a superior civilization, and we need to strengthen it, defend it, we need to refurbish the pillars of American exceptionalism, because without us, there is no Western civilization, and it's up to us to defend this civilization, it's up to us to restore the rule of law, it's up to us to strengthen our national defense. Mostly, it's up to us to raise, have a lot of babies and raise them right and make sure that they believe the things that we believe and we can hold our culture and civilization together. Thank you, and I'll take questions at the end of this. So. Uh, Congressman, thank you for joining us today. Um, I'm a pharmacist and an attorney. Uh, when I lived in Arizona, I walked some of those armed patrols along the border uh, that you heard about a, couple, about a dozen years ago. And the point, uh, I'm not sure if Congress understands uh, that if an immigration bill is comprehensive, two things happen. One, the Supreme Court will declare that the Congress has taken the issue away from the states and the states can do nothing. And then second, if a president like Obama decides not to enforce the law, there's no constitutional mechanism for anybody to force him to enforce the law. So the states are left paralyzed and can do nothing, then the federal government do, does nothing. So in other words, a comprehensive bill is in and of itself poison. 
And I, I'm wondering how much sentiment, how much this is realized in Congress right now. The, com the comprehensive bill is in and of itself what? Poison. Poison. Okay. I missed that one word. Okay. Um, the, um, the comprehensive bill is in and of itself poison was the, uh, the central piece. I'll go back to that. I think it is. And that's why I call it instantaneous uh, and uh, retroactive and, and um, prospective amnesty. But the gentleman has described how, how badly our rule of law has taken hits here during this last few years. If, and, and it was amazing to me. I went to the Supreme Court and uh, listened to their oral arguments on SB 1070, Arizona's immigration law. And I actually sat there with two authors of that, Russell Pierce and Chris Kobach, in between the two of them. You'll know them both. And, uh, boy, they're, they're good men. And, but that bill was written in Arizona to mirror federal law, to say we want to, we want to match federal law, we want to help enforce federal law, we want to protect Arizona while we're doing it. And I was, I was surprised, and I'll say even amazed, that the Supreme Court would come down with a ruling that concluded that a state could not enforce a law that was a, a, a federal immigration law on the rationale, this is an irrational rationale, they do that once in a while, on the rationale that, that there's so many delicate things that balance the interests of the federal government, it's impossible for a state to contribute or detract from that without inadvertently messing up that delicate balance, which means the State Department's got foreign policy and Department of Defense has that component of it, and the Department of Homeland Security's got another component, the Commerce has got another component, and so that delicate balance is something only the federal government can do, but of course Congress can't have anything to say about that either, um, because we also apparently don't do the delicate balance either. Well, we're supposed to tell the president what to do. He's telling all of America what to do, and the Supreme Court was um, complicit in that, in, in my view. So I think we need to get back to, and I'm not sure how we, how we address that on the SB 1070 piece, but I, I think we need to get back to the strong law enforcement. We need to have cooperation at all levels of government, as I said. You can't have a safe society if somebody says, well, my job, uh, I'm a deputy sheriff, so I serve papers, but if I see somebody commit a murder down the street, that's not really mine. That's the state's law, not the county's. That's, what, that's the same psychology that says that the, um, the law enforcement officers in Arizona can't enforce immigration law. There's a case from 2001, 2, or 3 that, uh, that actually a, Supreme, a, a, a circuit court decision that asserts that local law enforcement does have the authority to enforce immigration law, and that Arizona decision Eric Holder's uh, brainchild debilitated us. We've got a lot to do. It's going to take the right president. That's. I've seen in some publications somewhere that in the state of Florida, Sharia law has overtaken a township. And how do we go about reinforcing that? Uh, the, you know. I know it's got to be the state of Florida's job or that township to do such, but if they're not doing it, what can we do up here to get them to move on? The federal government or who? Okay, okay, I'll just tell you. Um, Frank says they're going to go into more depth on Sharia law later on this afternoon, but uh, I would just say that Sharia law is incompatible with the United States Constitution. It's incompatible with our belief system and our culture. And, and we need to be real plain about that, and wherever we go, uh, just, just simply reject this idea of Sharia law. And we should also remember that uh, they're moving people into this country, creating enclaves. They're, the assimilation hasn't been taking place. You can go to Europe and look at what goes on over there if you want to see what's, what's emerging here in the United States. You saw the story on the gun running going out of Cedar Rapids this week. Um, that's not only in Cedar Rapids, I don't think. It would be a coincidence if it happened to be the only place in America. I think it's going on in a lot of places in America. And so I go, um, I travel in and out of Europe and do the, as many of those negotiations as I can do. And I go into the inner cities. I go to the no-go zones in the Muslim sections of the, some of the major cities in Europe and walk down the streets, even though you're not supposed to go there, and take my video camera and film the transformation of, say, the Hague in the Netherlands, or Brussels in Belgium. 
and you can see what's coming here. There's a study that was done in a book written by Mark Stein, uh, it's called the Castro Study, where about 155 or 75 Turks moved in, uh, came into uh, Germany. That was 1970. By the year 2000, there were 2,850 there, and only one, cent, one symbol of assimilation, that was a German girl that married in. Otherwise, zero assimilation, a silo of an enclave, a transplant from Turkey. And I have said to them, they've invited me to go over and give them a speech and tell them how to adapt to their changing society, and I say this, you cannot rebuild your culture with somebody else's children. You've got to have the babies that it takes to repopulate yourselves and grow a little. And if you don't do that, somebody else's children will bring, bring somebody else's culture and they will transplant themselves and they will replace you. So that's a good place maybe to wrap this up and I appreciate you all being here. This is going to be an exciting day and I'm going to be around as much as I can. Thank you very much. <laughs>